Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 54th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Coy Wayne Westbrook of Houston, Texas, who was executed in 2016 at the age of 58. Well, I will tell everybody out there that uh, Elvis ain't dead yet. (laughs) Coy Wayne Westbrook was born on February 1st, 1958 in Houston, Texas. He grew up with both parents and throughout his time in school, he struggled academically. By the time eighth grade rolled around, he was a straight F student, and the school principal ended up scheduling a meeting with Coy's parents. In attendance of the meeting was the principal, Coy's parents, and a psychologist by the name of Dr. Kennett. Dr. Kennett informed Coy's parents that he had below average intelligence and had a learning disability. He recommended that Coy get a full neurological examination but his parents never followed up with anyone. The principal then spoke up and let Coy's parents know that they were not babysitters and that Coy would not turn out to be anything. He recommended that it would be better for Coy to be put into a vocational school to learn a specific trade, but he was no longer welcomed at the school. Failing to put Coy into a different school or vocational school, he stopped going to school altogether. As he got older, Coy began to heavily drink and suffered from depression. Despite this, he was able to marry and had a daughter with his first wife, but they divorced. At the age of 37, he married for the second time to a woman by the name of Gloria Coons in 1995. The two had a rocky relationship, and Coy was never okay with the fact that Gloria used to prostitute. The two eventually ended up divorcing the following year in 1996 But throughout their separation, Gloria kept changing her mind on whether or not she wanted Coy back. No matter what was said, Coy would always go back to Gloria, help her out financially, and meet with her whenever she asked. The two ended up moving in with each other again before separating towards the end of October 1997. During this last separation, Coy learned that his nine-year-old daughter had been hurt by his ex-wife's boyfriend so the stressful event made him more depressed and caused him to drink more as well. He eventually moved into his own place and Gloria went to go live with her best friend in an apartment. This friend, by the name of Ruth, was known in town as 18-Pack Ruthie because she would accept an 18-pack of beers payment from her Johns. She was a heavy drinker and Gloria ended up confiding in Coy, telling him that she could not handle living with Ruth but she also did not want to be alone. According to Coy, at around 2 or 3 p.m., the two reconciled and he let her know he would stop by her place after he got off of work. Coy decided not to go to work and spent time contemplating whether or not he should meet with Gloria because he felt something was not right. He found it odd that she would tell him she wanted nothing to do with him and then right after say she wanted him. He thought back to a time she had threatened him and thought the meetup would be a setup. Despite him being wary of the situation, he went to Gloria's apartment at around 9.30 p.m. and when he arrived, there were a few people already there that happened to be drinking and socializing. He asked what was going on and Gloria introduced him to the people there and then went into the bedroom with another man and proceeded to have sex with him. Coy tried to ignore it and had about three or four beers before he decided that enough was enough and that he was going to leave. He felt that if Gloria truly wanted him back, he would have been there alone with her, so he spoke to Ruth and asked her to tell Gloria that he left when she was done doing whatever she was doing in the room. As he was talking to Ruth, there was a knock at the door and Coy answered it. There were a few more men at the door and Coy asked them what they were doing there and they responded by telling him that they were invited over to come and party. He told them to have fun and walked to his car. 
Everyone at the party got paranoid because there were drugs there, so Ruth had a guy named Tony follow Coy to prevent him from leaving. Tony met Coy at his car and told him to get out, but Coy refused. Tony then opened the door and pulled an almost 300 pound Coy out of the vehicle. The two men then began to fight, but Tony was overpowered by Coy, so he ran back to the house. Believing that Tony gave up, Coy got back into his car to start it and realized that the keys were no longer in the ignition. He knew that Tony had to have swiped them, so he grabbed his deer rifle that was in his truck. Coy had worked as a courier who would deliver large sums of money to banks, so he always kept a gun on him. He had been delivering in some rougher areas, so he switched to carrying his larger deer rifle with him. After grabbing the gun, he went back to Gloria's house and asked for his keys. Two men began throwing Coy's keys in the air and taunting him. Ruth then spoke up and said they were going to kill him, but Coy responded by telling her that he had a loaded rifle and would never let that happen. Angered, Ruth threw a beer in Coy's face and ran towards him. She was immediately met with a bullet. Another man got up from the couch he was sitting on, but after he was shot by Coy, his body flew back on the couch. He then shot Tony and walked over to the room Gloria was in, but the door was locked so he kicked it down. The man who was having sex with Gloria was on top of her and she pushed him off when Coy came in. She got scared and tried rolling off the bed and that's when Coy fired another shot which hit her in the hand. He proceeded to kill the remaining people in the house but his wife was still alive unbeknownst to Coy. A neighbor ran over and saw the bodies and blood so immediately called the police. Coy casually walked to his car, put the gun inside, and walked back into the apartment to wait for the police. Within seven minutes, police arrived to the scene of the crime and ordered Coy to get on the floor. He refused to get on the bloody floor and told cops to just arrest him. When paramedics noticed that Gloria was still alive, she was taken to the hospital but died shortly after her arrival. Coy was arrested and indicted on murder charges of five people and while in jail, he was given a $100,000 bond. Being that Coy was a heavy drinker, the jail put him in a 12-step program and he was placed in a separate wing for addicts. Prisoners were in single cells and the cellmate next door to him by the name of Philip Jones was working with prosecutors in order to get info out of Coy and for him to get a lesser sentence. Philip told Coy that he needed to do something about the people testifying against him or else he was going to get killed himself. Coy said he did not want any other people killed and he already knew his fate was sealed. The next day, Philip told Coy that someone was waiting on the phone for him and it was an undercover cop by the name of Gary F. Johnson who called himself the Harris County Hitman. He offered to kill five people for him and Coy reminded him that everything was recorded so the undercover detective hung up the phone. His trial began six months later in Harris County, Texas, and Officer Johnson spoke at the trial and had his portion of the recorded call, but the recording from the jail was destroyed and never played during trial. Coy was ultimately convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death in September of 1998. Coy did try to appeal, but his appeals were all denied. They're, they're, they also have a, a thing up there that if you're not, if you don't have a speech impediment and you're not winking, blinking, drooling, or, uh, you know, look like you've got Down syndrome, you don't qualify. Well, I don't qualify because I'm not winking, blinking, drooling, and I don't have Down syndrome. That doesn't mean I'm not retarded. It doesn't mean I doesn't, I don't have uh, any deficits in my case. While on death row, Coy had an interview with the execution watch and said he was not allowed to see visitors and the food was horrible. Uh, as far as my treatment here, I tell you, the food is atrocious. And these sergeants up here tell you, well, you have to eat what they send you. No, we don't. 
and they know they don't. We used to have a sergeant up here by the name of Miss Stringer. Stringer. And every, every time Miss Stringer would find this food to be unacceptable, the tray's not to be hot, she'd send that tray carrier back over there to the kitchen. And, of course, it made that kitchen captain all upset, been out of shape. But you know what? They need to get their acting gear over here. At 58, and after 17 years on death row, his execution date was nearing. For his final meal, he was served what every other prisoner had that day, which was sliced bread, mashed potatoes and gravy, green beans, baked chicken, black-eyed peas, orange cake, and to drink, he was able to choose between water, tea, or punch. He was executed on March 9, 2016 by method of electrocution. Well, like I said, Alvin Andrew Kelly gave me that name. He was a death row inmate up here in 2008. They executed him. And uh, he was born in 1951. Uh -huh. So... We became pretty good friends, and a lot of us up here, you know, we become spiritual people. Sure, sure, that's natural. And uh, he, Alvin was a spiritual person, and we elected him as our spiritual leader. I see. So one day I was out in the day room. This is when I used to go to the day room all the time. I, I've since quit going to the day room. Uh, <clears throat> he, he had a advertisement out of a, a magazine and he said you're now Elvis <laughs> and it was an Elvis impersonator eating a 10-foot subway sandwich so he said every time I look at this guy I think of you <laughs> that's interesting so I said well I don't know why you're thinking of me I don't even eat that much thank you guys for watching and now for discussion and question time do you think his low IQ should have been brought up, or does that not matter? Do you guys think a self-defense case should have been brought up? If you catch your spouse in the act of cheating and you get angry and kill someone, what do you guys think should happen? I have seen women bleach clothes, destroy homes, cars, and personal property, and they seem to always get away with it. Should they be charged or understood? I think it was unfortunate that he was being bullied by people who were drunk and high, but killing all five of them in cold blood was overkill. He could have just called the cops on them and have them busted, and that way he would have also been able to get his keys. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below.